Praise our risen Lord. As uh, Pastor Michael said, my name is Dustin Pence, and it's my great joy to be here uh, with you to share in worship and to offer this uh, sermon. Uh, he and I both served in Olathe at Grace Young Methodist Church. We actually shared the same office uh, at different times uh, when we were there. And uh, one of the other churches, a couple other churches I served were up 169 Highway, uh, uh, just off the road of Parker, Beagle, and Fontana. I don't know if you know those little towns by Paola and Osawatomie, but I served there as I was a student. Um, I served as a local pastor for 18 years, and then the last six years have been leading the Kansas Methodist Foundation, and it's a great joy to be with you today. As Pastor Michael said, I'll be doing a training. It's a kind of a practical training about how we can make the most with our resources in giving to support the church or other charitable causes during life as well as considerations for estate planning. So like giving from your IRA and other kind of causes, so we'd love to have you uh, join following worship. Uh, if it's not clear, I'm going to talk about money today. Jesus actually talks a lot about money. Uh, he talks almost more about money than any other topic except the kingdom of God. And so we're going to visit about one of his parables. Uh, the parable is actually called the parable of the talents. My guess is many of you have heard that parable. And it's very applicable to lots of aspects of our lives. And it's a parable that we can think about in, in relationship to many different gifts and talents that God has blessed us with. Uh, musical gifts or the ability to do complex math with your mind or many others. But in the first century in Jesus' day... Uh, a talent was a specific amount of money. It was actually a very large amount of money. A talent, one talent, was the amount of money of 6,000 days of a worker's wage. 6,000 days of a worker's wage. That, that's like 20 years of a worker's wage. I, I did some math, I, I may be wrong, but it's roughly about a million dollars in today's dollars, one talent. So it, we sometimes read our scriptures and it says a valuable coin or valuable coins. Well, they're really valuable coins, okay? So I'm going to read our scripture passage for us today uh, from Matthew chapter 25. And, and I'm actually going to say the word a million dollars instead of a talent. You'll see a talent if you're reading along. But I want you to hear it like those first disciples would have heard it. I invite you to listen for a word that God wants to say to you today as I read. Jesus says this, For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five million dollars, to another two million dollars, to another one million dollars, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. The one who had received the five million dollars went off at once and traded with them and made five million more. In the same way, the one with the two million dollars made two million more. But the one who had the one million dollars went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and, and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five million dollars came forward, bringing the five million more, saying to him, Master, you handed over to me five million dollars. See, I have made five million more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had the two million dollars also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two million dollars. See, I have made two million more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trusted in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one million dollars also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent, your million dollars, in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. 
For to all those who have, more will be given, and they'll have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. What would you do if you were entrusted with a million dollars? One talent. Woohoo, that'd be a good day, right? Would you go and try to use it in a way that aligns with God's purposes? Or, or maybe you would, would you uh, try to grow it to uh, expand it to make a greater difference? What would you do? Or would you go and bury it in the ground? Maybe a better question we ought to be wrestling with is what are we doing with the resources we have been entrusted? Uh, our scripture passage comes at the very end of Jesus' public ministry. He's there in Jerusalem during that final week, the week that we remember as Holy Week. And it's about midweek. And it seems to me that, that he's trying to prepare. It seems he's trying to prepare uh, himself for his final meal with the disciples, trying to prepare uh, for his crucifixion on the cross and, and uh, resurrection. It seems he's also trying to prepare the disciples for life after he has returned to the Father. There seems to be lessons that he wants us and his disciples to hear and to heed that make a lasting difference in our lives. He tells this parable, the, the very next parable in the same chapter, chapter 25, he says that it matters how we treat one another. It matters how we care for our neighbors, especially those who are naked or those who are hungry or those who are strangers. Jesus says, as you do unto one of these, the least of these, you do unto me. That there's these lessons that he wants us to hear and to heed with our lives. And that's where we hear this parable. I suspect there's lots of lessons that we can glean from this, maybe even lots of questions that we have about this parable. I know I have questions about it. I can't wait to see Jesus, to talk to him about it, to better understand. I today, during this sermon, want to just really focus on three lessons that I think are important for us as we think about our own discipleship and the way that we live out our lives. And the first one's probably the most important. And it's the lesson to understand that the resources these three servants or slaves have, the resources that they have in this parable, they are not their own. You heard that, right? The resources that they have are not their own. Rather, they are entrusted with these resources for a time. They're not the owners of the resources. They're the caretakers of them. They're the stewards of these resources on behalf of another. And, and I think that's important for us to think about as we think about this stuff in our lives. Maybe it's resources that we've been given from others who have given uh, to us, and we've received something, an inheritance or something like that. Or maybe it's resources that we've earned because of good and faithful service through the course of our lives. Or maybe it's resources that we have uh, invested well and wisely and have grown. All, all that stuff that you and I have that we worry about, or we wonder about, or we consider, the Scripture says that it's God's. Actually, you can go look at the beginning of Psalm 24. The heavens and the earth and all that is within them is the Lord's. Uh, we're, we're caretakers of these things in our lives for a time. You see, there'll come a day when you and I will breathe our last. And all those things that we worry about, all those things that we consider, they won't be going with us. Now... Where we're going, we're not going to need them. Amen? <laughs> Amen. We're not going to need them. And yet we are still responsible for how we use the resources entrusted to us. And that's really the second lesson. 
We are responsible for how we use the things that have been entrusted to us, just like these three persons in this parable. There's a United Methodist pastor who retired a few years ago from Ohio. His name is Michael Slaughter. And and he wrote a book called Shiny Gods. And he writes in this book, he says, he says, what you do with what you have makes all the difference in the world. Let me say it again. What you do with what you have makes all the difference in the world. The next sentence says, what you do with what you have has the power to change the world. We have this capacity within us to use all the different things that we have been entrusted as we're led by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in our world around us for the things that we are responsible for. I I don't know, but as I read this parable, it makes me wonder that what would happen the day that I breathe my last? I could be wrong. But I can envision myself getting the opportunity to stand before Jesus and him asking me something like he like we hear in this parable. Maybe it goes something like this. Dustin, what did you do with what I gave you? And I'll get an opportunity to make a response. My guess is he'll be asking that about lots of things in my life, maybe our lives. What did you do with the time that I gave you? What did you do with the relationships that I brought into your life? What did you do with the gifts and strengths and calling that I gave you? And maybe also, what did you do with the resources that I entrusted to you? And I'm going to get to make an account. I'm quite frankly praying for a lot of grace. Because there are definitely times when I have wasted time. And there are times when I have squandered resources. There are times when I was led by the Spirit to do something, to to reach out to someone or to to forgive someone or to try something new that scared me, and I did not. And so I'm praying for a lot of grace. And yet, I think He wants our very best, one day at a time. As I think about the ways that we live our lives, you know, Maybe we just think of today. We can't do anything about yesterday, and we can't really do too much about tomorrow. All we can do is what we have been given for this day. Maybe there's a relationship that that is broken in your life that you feel compelled to reach out to, to say, I'm sorry, or to, to offer forgiveness. Or maybe there's some ministry that you've been prompted by the Spirit to be a part of, but you've been scared to take action. Maybe today's the day that you say, God, I don't know how this is going to happen. It doesn't make sense to me, but use me. Use me. Take my life like we just sang and use me. Or maybe it's about our resources. Maybe it's about us saying, how can I place into your hands my best to grow my giving to God through the life of this church? Maybe it's for the van. Or maybe it's for some other cause that you care about where where we say, God, use what I have. Help me to grow in my relationship with you in the way that I steward the resources entrusted to me. And to figure out and build a plan for this year or for next year and to move towards growing in that relationship. I think it also plays itself out as we think about the end of our journey of life. That's actually where I work with lots of families, is thinking about the end of our journey of life and what kind of blessing we can make with the resources in our lives for those who will come after us. There was a gentleman that uh, gave a gift to a school that I was connected to. It wasn't, wasn't an estate gift at the end of life. It was a gift during life. And, and as this family was giving this gift, the, the, the husband, who was the student of the school in a previous time, uh, made a statement as they were giving the gift. He said this. He said, I came here to the school. I came here and I drank from wells that I did not dig. And I ate food that came from fields that I did not till. 
and I sat under the shade of trees that I did not plant. It was kind of this poetic way of saying, I'm the beneficiary of so many things that people have given from those who've gone before me. And now it's my turn for those who will come after me. First time I met this church, when, when did this church begin? Does anybody know the year the congregation began? Not necessarily the sanctuary built, but the church began. Does anybody know the year? I'm sorry? 150 years ago. Give or take a few, right? So raise your hand if you were a founding member. None of us, right? We're all beneficiaries of people who have gone before us. Even if this wasn't the church where we grew up, there were probably people in our family or people in our church or people in our community who loved us, who shaped our life and our faith. And it's all those people who have gone before us. They, they gave joyfully and generously, and they shaped our lives. And there comes a time when we, we say thank you. And we think of that whole great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. And we remember the ways they've impacted us. And then we wrestle with what can we do for those who will come beyond us? What would it look like for you to leave a part of your estate to make a difference in the life and ministry of this church? Maybe also other charitable causes that make a difference in your life. To give a gift of a lifetime for those who will come after you. The last church that I was pastoring, I... I met with one of the families. I, I actually invited them to give a tithe of their estate. That's usually what I invite families to consider is uh, what would a tithe of your estate look like? And they said, you know, Pastor, that's a great idea, giving a tithe. We're actually planning to give a child's portion. Uh, this family had three kids. And so they were going to give one-fourth of their estate to each of those three children and one-fourth to the charitable causes that they cared about. The church was going to get half of that, but there were other things that made a difference in the community that they cared about that they wanted to give a gift to support. And I was like, wow, that's so awesome. To think of your charitable things as one of your offspring, to be a blessing for those who come after us. Friends, we are responsible for the things that have been entrusted to us of all sorts, and, and we're called to figure out how we can use them to make a difference both now and into the future. The last lesson I hear in this parable that I want to lift up today is that we're called to take action. We're called to, to not just ponder things. Jesus doesn't tell this parable so that we remember this parable or quote this parable. He, he tells us this so that we live these actions that we learn. And you maybe heard it didn't go so well for that third person in the parable, right? It didn't go so well for him. It wasn't because he tried his best. It wasn't because he risked himself and fell short and missed the mark. It was rather that he was so captured by his fear that he didn't take any action at all. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we focus on what we don't have. Or we focus on what we can't do. Or we focus on how little my offering would be. And we say, well, that's not going to be much, so I won't give my gift. As opposed to saying, God, with what you've entrusted me, I want to give. I want to serve. I want to make an offering in my life that you can multiply. And then it really becomes about God's ability, not our gift. In some ways, our hearts become the barrier for us risking ourselves to be used by God. I actually had a similar congregant from that same church that I was serving, and she came uh, to meet with me in my office. I was talking about uh, considering giving a gift to the endowment fund, the legacy fund of the church, and, and she came to me and she said, Pastor, I'd like to give a gift from my estate, but I don't have very much. And, and my kids need most of what I have, but could I still give a gift? It's going to be a much smaller gift, but it'll still be my best gift. 
And I couldn't help but think of the woman who gave the two small coins into the treasury and how Jesus talked about how great was her faith. Our Wesleyan practice and behavior and faith is is where we live out a life and where we, we give to God our best. We place the whole of who we are into God's hands and we say, God, use me. I don't know how this is going to turn out and I'm anxious to sometimes calm my fears and use my life, use my resources, all those things that I've been entrusted and help me to be a blessing. There comes a time where we we almost practice our, our faith by saying, God, with all that I am and all that I have, I want to honor you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the three, like we heard today. Friends, I invite you to wonder, God, what would, what would God do with your gift, your service, your effort, your love? What kind of legacy will you leave with what you've been entrusted? Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh God, we ask that you might continue to use us, transform us, transform our hearts most especially. Use our service, use our resources, use our love, use the whole of who we are to make a difference. Help us to grow our connection with you and to one another as we love you and as we love our neighbor, as we love ourselves. Gracious God, we ask that you will help us to live our lives in such a way that those who come behind us will look back and think back and will have found us faithful. God, we look forward to that day when we see you face to face and that you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. God, with your spirit, lead us as we seek to be faithful one day at a time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.